Good morning, friend. My name is George Hinman, and I want to invite you to take out your Bible and open up to Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 17. This is where we find the Ten Commandments, as they're usually called, or Ten Words, as the Bible itself actually refers to them, Ten Matters. We're looking at these ten things as followers of Jesus. And with each of them, we've been working hard to try to look behind the commandment and see what's the gift that God is trying to give his people and, and us as his people today. So it, it, we've come today to the seventh word, and uh, we'll read it together if you choose to join me. It's very brief, so you've got to be quick, but uh, Exodus chapter 20, verse 14. So just look down to verse 14 there, and uh, we'll read together. Listen carefully. You're reading God's holy word. You shall not commit adultery. This is the word of the Lord. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord lasts forever. Lord Jesus, you are the living word. You're present to us. You're the one who makes us present to one another. Speak, would you? Speak for your servants are listening. Pour out your Holy Spirit to bring this word to life in us. For your sake and in your name we pray. Amen. Well, uh, Caitlin Beatty is a single 34-year-old woman who wrote an article not long ago in the New York Times interesting article. It's about sexuality and a theology of sexuality, and she writes this. She says, I yearn for guidance on how to integrate faith and sexuality. Kind of a plea um, for thoughtful people to just move beyond the permissions and prohibitions to a, a, a positive understanding of what human sexuality is all about and the sacredness of this gift. Uh, she raised some really good questions for me. Um, and as I'm studying this text this week, I'm realizing, oh my goodness, the seventh word really points us in the direction that she's looking. The seventh word exists to protect the sanctity of marriage. But, um, but behind it, there's this gift of sexual wholeness. And that's a gift for all of us, no matter who we are, I mean, whether we're single or married, whether we're young or old, uh, widowed, divorced, prudes and prodigals, all of us, the gift of sexual wholeness. So I thought, well, what would I say uh, to Caitlin if I just had a few minutes to talk with her about it? And I'd like to kind of share my response to Caitlin with you. And uh, she says, you know, 34 years old, no husband has come along. I've tried to live with the sexual ethic that I was raised with, but I've struggled with that and haven't always. So what would we say to Caitlin? What would you say to Caitlin? Well, I would want her to know about what I call the double embrace. Um, the double embrace. Let, let me ask you to use your imagination. You, you, to have faith, you always have to use your imagination. So just picture in your mind this image. Two persons embracing one another. Would you imagine that? Not, not a husband and a wife, not, not two adulterers, two persons. Uh, in fact, imagine that these are God, that this is God in two persons. That what you have in, in this image is God the Father embracing God the Son in love, in intimacy. If you have that, what you have is God embracing humanity and humanity embracing God. So I think, Caitlin, for you the question is, can you see yourself inside that embrace? If you can see yourself inside of that embrace, I'll tell you what. What it means is God meets you not in your sexual brokenness, but in the sexual wholeness of his perfect son, Jesus Christ. And it means no matter what your sexual experience there's always a greater intimacy available to you in an experience of Jesus. So I'll loop back around in, in a moment to the double embrace, but that's, that's the double embrace right there. And the question really is, do we see ourselves in that embrace? Because that, that's the only place I'm aware of where we can really fully receive the gift of sexual wholeness, the sexual wholeness that's implicit behind the seventh word, the double embrace. But what I'd like to do before returning to that is I want to share two implications of the seventh word, um, two surprises, I think, for us. 
about sex. And, and, and one is that sex is um, it's way bigger than the culture tells us. And the other is that sex is much less than the culture tells us. So let's take those in turn. First of all, way bigger. What I'd like to, to, to communicate is that sex is much more powerful than the culture tells us because it seals a bond of souls, a bond of souls. Let's go back to the commandment again. Uh, the Lord says to Israel, you shall not commit adultery. Now, the reason for that is when you're messing around with your bodies, you're not just messing around with your bodies, you're messing around with your souls. It, notice how the seventh commandment proceeds from the sixth commandment. We, we looked at the sixth last week, and we learned there, particularly when we read Genesis chapter 9, verse 6, that you and I are made in the image of God. All, all people are, which means we're not just bodies. We're not just physical. We're spiritual beings. We're embodied souls. A and see, this is now being carried into the seventh commandment. When there is sexual intimacy, there is spiritual intimacy. And it's important for us to realize that because the culture does not tell us that. In the culture, uh, we think of sex as just a kind of another gym machine or like a yoga pose between two people. It's just physical. Uh, output leads to input. Input leads to output. Physical stimulation. It's nothing more than that. No emotion. No spirituality. Mark Edmondson, who's faculty at the University of Washington, writes, <coughs> hooking up is a fantasy of frictionless sex, sex free of deep emotion. Uh, hooking up is sex that lets you keep on sliding over surfaces, moving from partner to partner as smoothly as you move from one site to another site on a laptop, as though there weren't any emotion and you couldn't get hurt, and there's, it's just physical. But that's not the case. It doesn't work that way. This is not true uh, physiologically. Now those of you who are biologists are telling us that actually there's a deep bond that gets formed in our brains around uh, sexual intimacy. Patricia Wirakun, by the way, a Sri Lankan uh, lecturer at, uh, from the University of Sydney in Australia, she says sexual intimacy bonds a couple at the brain level. I in other words, sex provokes a kind of a brain bath of hormones uh, that wash over us, the cuddle hormones, oxytocin, vasopressin, and these reinforce a bond and they change the chemistry of our brain to draw us closer to this individual. And it's not just a physical bond. The Bible tells us that it's a spiritual bond as well. F for example, let me show you two passages. First, Malachi chapter 2, verse 14. Here's a text that uses the word covenant, a really rich concept in uh, Israel life. We read, the Lord has a witness between you and the wife of your youth to whom you've been faithless, though she's your companion, and your wife by covenant. See that? Your, she's your wife. Notice, the Lord is between the two of you, and she's your wife by covenant. What this text is telling us is that uh, marriage is a covenant, and sex is the sign of that covenant. And a covenant, uh, to the Hebrew mind, is always a relationship between three parties, not two. A husband, a wife, and the Lord, pulling those two together, making a bond, sealing a bond between their two souls. And, and then the other passage is 1 Corinthians 6, verse 16. This tells us that the bond is formed by sex, the sign of, of the covenant, even when the marriage isn't present. So here Paul is talking about prostitution. He says, do you not know that whenever... Whoever is united to a prostitute becomes one body, body with her. For it is said, the Lord shall be one flesh. Now that's a reference to Genesis chapter 2 that's describing this body and soul unity. Uh, and then he, he, just to make sure we, we get it, that this is a spiritual union, he adds in verse 19, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. So to be joined physically with a prostitute is to be joined spiritually and your souls somehow become linked whether that's your intention or not. And this is why C.S. Lewis writes in Mere Christianity, the truth is that wherever a man lies with a woman there, whether they like it or not, a transcendental relation is set up between them which must be eternally enjoyed or 
eternally endured, a transcendental relation. I mean, that's really interesting. And, and, and it, what, what this is all saying is there's a real gift here. This is a gift, actually, that, that your soul is bound to another soul through sexual intimacy. It's meant to strengthen an, a marriage, which is what the seventh word is protecting, a marriage. And that's why m- sex always belongs exclusively within the bond of a lifelong commitment. You want to protect that spiritual bond. This is, by the way, what the seventh word is all about. This is what all the words are about. I told you earlier, uh, th- these are not like the law of the stop sign. They're like the law of the fire, which is Dorothy Sayers' uh, language. You know, you, you can change the law of the stop sign by legislative action, but you try to do that with the fire. The first legislator that walks out and puts their hand in the fire get, gets burned. Uh, these are laws like gravity or thermodynamics. You can't change them. This is why... Proverbs 6, 27 says, can a man embrace fire and his clothes not be burned? In the context there is adultery. And the answer is, is no. And, and some of us have an experience of that. If, if you've had a, a, spiritual, a, a sexual relationship with someone, uh, this is why it's hard to break up after that union um, because there's been a bond that's been formed. And you're not just losing a partner, you're losing a part of yourself. Your soul is diminished by that. And there's deep pain associated with that. This is also why some of us tend to stay in relationships too long. Well, the relationship and the, in- the, the emotional intimacy of the relationship may have died long ago. What's keeping the relationship together? Sexual intimacy. It's kind of gluing a couple together. And you don't, you don't want that. You, you want your relationship to be built on uh, emotional intimacy and relational intimacy. And unfortunately, when the sex is all that's sustaining the relationship, what, what happens is you lose the incentive that you need to do the hard work of building relational intimacy, the work of curiosity or communi- communication, uh, the work of serving one another and celebrating each other, uh, the work of vulnerability and forgiveness. So we want to think about our souls when we think about sex, right? Um, <laughs> When you're thinking about engaging sexually with someone, you want to ask yourself, do I really want a, what Lewis calls a transcendental relationship with this person? And you go, oh, that changes things. I'm not even sure I want lunch with them, let alone uh, 60 years of marriage. But we should think about that because that's what happens, whether we like it or not, when we're sexually engaging with somebody. There's a bond of the souls. In every physical embrace, there's a spiritual embrace if it's sexual. And that's powerful. And that's way bigger than the culture tells us. So this is what I would say. I would try to get across to Caitlin. I I would say, Caitlin, I want want you to think about this bond, this spiritual bond. It's what makes it sacred. I I want you to think about it in the context of the double embrace. Let's come back to that. Think about the soul, your soul, in the double embrace. Do you cherish your soul as God cherishes your soul? See, in that embrace, God is not asking you about your sexual brokenness, not asking you about your sexual history, not asking you about who you've been with, who you're with now, or who you're not with. He's trying to give you a gift, trying to give you the gift of sexual wholeness for you. And in that moment, you, you're, you're caught in an embrace between the father and the son where there's nothing but delight and joy and love. And it's in this place that you can be restored sexually, that all of us are meant to be restored sexually. And it's in this place that we find an intimacy that is far greater than anything we have ever or can ever find in physical sexuality. Which brings us to the second implication. Okay, not just way bigger. Secondly, much smaller. Sex is much smaller than the culture tells us. Because our souls find a much, much deeper intimacy in a bond with Jesus. A bond with Jesus. Back to the text. You shall not commit adultery. Now remember who heard these words and where they were. Um, you, you can't 
commit adultery and just hurt yourself. Uh, this is not about consent between two parties. You're going to hurt a whole lot of other people. And at the foot of Sinai, the people who first hear this command, they're being formed into a spiritual community. I mean, these 10 words, they're not just about sex. They're not even primarily about sex. They're about a spiritual community, right? Listen to the language at the heading of the 10 commandments. You can look at that if you still have it open. I am the Lord, your God. That's covenant language. You are mine, it says. And then if you go back a, a paragraph or two, you get to Exodus 19, and, and you read this beautiful, intimate language. Where the Lord says, I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. You are my treasured possession. This is metaphorical language of intimacy. Uh, the covenant bond. It's, I've have, I want to have it with you, the Lord says. Uh, there's a picture of a, uh, of a mother eagle with her fledgling flying on her back. We see this in Seattle, carrying her on eagles' wings. There's an image of a, of a treasured possession like cherished lovers who are deep embrace. And the, and the Lord's speaking of intimacy with him that he's inviting this community, Israel, into in that moment. See, there's a greater intimacy. But our culture doesn't understand this. I mean, we, you know, we can be forgiven until God encounters us, thinking that sex maybe is the greatest fulfillment or experience of intimacy. But we're here to say it's not. I mean, the culture says there's almost nothing greater than sex, right? We get this message subliminally a thousand times every day in so many ways that, that sex is the deepest form of intimacy, that you're not wanted until you're sexy, and that if you really want a fulfillment in life, then you've got to find a sex partner, and it's got to be really good, right? It's the pressure that the culture puts on us. Ernest Becker, in his classic, The Denial of Death, said this is just what's going to happen when you displace God from where he belongs, when we reject God, the only way to, place to turn to is what he calls the romantic solution. And he writes in The Denial of Death, the love partner becomes the divine ideal within which to fulfill one's life. We look to the love partner for fulfillment. But ultimately, he argues, this becomes, quote, a disappointing answer to life's riddle. Because if your partner is your all, then any shortcoming in him becomes a major threat to you. That's Ernest Becker. That's interesting. See, he's raising the question, do we really want to think this way about sex as though it's ultimate, as though it has the power to fulfill us and this alone? I mean, is, could that even be true? If you just think about it, how many people are actually sexually active? I mean, at any given time, most of us are not. And, and if you had to have sex to have fulfillment, what would this say about children or singles or uh, cup, couples, married couples who, who don't have fulfilling sexual experience or uh, people who have had trauma or abuse, um, widows, elderly, people who are not capable of sex? Are we saying you're not capable of fulfillment? No, of course not. That's not the message. The Bible offers us so much more. See, the Bible says that actually there are two ways of experiencing the, the one body flesh that we read about in Genesis 2. There are two ways. And one is just a dim reflection of the other. And one is for some, but the other is for all. And what it all points to is intimacy with Jesus. Intimacy with Jesus is the deepest and greatest intimacy that human beings can enjoy. So we get a picture of this, two more verses about this. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16, Paul writes, Do you know, do you not know that whoever is united to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For it is said, and here he quotes Genesis, the two shall become one flesh, body and soul. And, then, and, uh, and, and he says, then he's talking about uh, marriage, literal marriage, um, but it points to spiritual marriage. Uh, bond with Jesus. He says, this is a great mystery, and I'm applying it to Christ and the church. I'm sorry, I put the wrong, I, I meant to put up there 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16. <laughs> it, um, and he's, so the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a sharing in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a sharing in the body of Christ? That's the one I wanted. So you see, what he's saying is when you come to the communion table, there's a sharing in the body of Christ, the blood of Christ. There's this one flesh uni union with Jesus and with the people who join with you at the table. And then Ephesians 5, 32, where he's also citing uh, the two will become one flesh. 
But he says, I'm not talking about husband and wife here. He says, this is a great ministry, and I'm applying it to Christ and the church. He's saying, yeah, marriage is awesome. But what it does is it points to a greater reality that is for all of us, a union between Christ and the church, that intimacy, that bond. So in other words, the greatest symbol of of true intimacy isn't a bed, like the culture tells us. It's a table, a communion table, like Jesus tells us. I learned this recently. Did you know that, you know, in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus talks about the seventh commandment. You shall not commit adultery. He uses the word lust, even when you lust after another person. But when he talks about communion, he uses the same word. In um, Luke twenty two fifteen, 15, he says to his disciples, I have eagerly desired, that's the same word, to eat this Passover with you. This is the first communion experience. He's saying, oh man, I lust to share this meal with you. The word lust, that, that word really means just deep, deep, deep passion. Jesus has this yearning to meet his disciples at the table because he wants to be intimate with them for his sake as well as for theirs. Interesting passage. This is the deepest intimacy. So if you can't be fulfilled without sex, think about Jesus. He was single. He never had sex. He, he lived the most fulfilling life of any human being that ever walked the face of this earth. He's the embodiment of human wholeness, right? What does this mean for us then and the yearning that we all experience as part of our sexuality? It means that the yearning isn't ultimately for a physical experience with a, a mate. It's for a spiritual experience with God and Jesus Christ. It means that we are called to build intimacy with Jesus first and foremost. The goal of life isn't marriage. (laughs) The goal of life isn't sex. The goal of life is Jesus. This is why Jesus tells us that in heaven there will be no marriage because why would you need the sign when you have the thing that is signified, the reality, intimacy with God? Our human sexuality has been built into us by God to be fulfilled by God alone. By the way, this is what liberated women in the early church because they were no longer defined by their relationship to men. By the way, this is what sustained chastity for singles in the early church because they were finding intimacy with Jesus and intimacy with other Christ followers in that community. By the way, this is what transformed sexual minorities. Jackie Hill Perry writes that heterosexuality is not a fruit of the Spirit. It's not the goal, neither is Uh, heterosexual marriage, it's not the goal, but what is a fruit of the Spirit? Self-control. And we all need that and we receive that from Jesus. By the way, this is what healed and strengthened marriages in the early church. The very thing that the seventh word was meant to protect. As it turns out, when you make Jesus your source of of intimacy, you're not constantly trying to beg it out of your, your partner and you don't have the temptation to turn them into a God. The romantic solution that Becker talks about. So we build this intimacy with Jesus, and we build this intimacy in Jesus with one another in a spiritual community called the church. We want to be this church. And for for me, this is what's so special about UPC. I mean, we're this family of people that were young and old, we're single and married, we're divorced and recovering, Uh, we're gay and we're straight, we're prudes and we're prods, we're believers and we're not yet believers. And I'm glad, I'm glad for all of that. I mean, you may not believe what the Bible believes about so many things. You may not believe what we believe. But you honor us with your presence in our, command, co- co- conf- in our family, in our community. And I just want to say there's a place for you. There's a place for you here. Thank you. Because here, family is not defined by sex. It's defined by Jesus. It's defined by intimacy with him that he shares with us and that we share with one another. And that transforms us. So uh, the seventh word teaches us that sex is way bigger than we think and compared to the intimacy we have in Jesus, it's much, much smaller than we think. So coming back to Caitlin, I would say before you embrace another, let Jesus embrace you. I I guess if you go home with anything, or you're already at home, if you stay at home with anything today, it's, it's that. Before you embrace another, let Jesus embrace you. I don't know, Caitlin, 
if she'll find a husband someday, but if she ever does, I, I would want her to let that relationship be an expression of the double embrace. You, you know, a, a union, a bond of two souls together with a third, the soul of Jesus. If a husband comes, that's what it should be. But why wait? You're in the double embrace right now. Today, your true lover kneels before you. You have no need of another. Someday you'll see his face. Someday you will feel the touch of his embrace around your body. And if today you need a little bit of an experience of that, then I want to invite you to join us around the communion table. Pull up and let's together be the arms of Jesus Christ in an intimate community that experiences him I want to close by telling you about a sculpture. It's a, a sculpture that I would say depicts the double embrace. It, it was in Scotland uh, near Edinburgh. The artist who made the sculpture did not know what to do with his sexuality until he found himself in the embrace of Jesus Christ. The sculpture shows uh, two men who are embracing each other, arms around, heads on each other's shoulders. They're identical men when you look closely except for one thing, the hands. The hands of one man have nail scars. And of course, then you realize, oh, this is Jesus. The idea for this sculpture comes from Romans chapter 5, where the Apostle Paul is talking about the two Adams. He's describing Jesus as the second Adam who's come to reverse all the damage that the first Adam has done to himself and to creation, to, to all of his uh, offspring. He's talking about the one man's obedience, the obedience of Jesus Christ, the second Adam who does this reversal. The fancy word theologically is called recapitulation. Listen to what Romans 5.19 says, For just as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, that's Jesus, the second Adam, the many will be made righteous. So, in other words, this man is seeing himself in the double embrace. Because if you look at the two figures, you realize one's Jesus and the other one is this man, now whole, now being healed by Jesus. This is what happens when we get caught up into the double embrace. The work of the second Adam on our behalf gives us his healing, the healing that's only available between the Father and the Son. Friend, now, I don't want to miss an opportunity before we go to invite you to join the double embrace. You are invited. Jesus says to all of us, this is my body which is given for you. This is my blood which is shed for you. It's an invitation to come into the covenant bond that he has come to make, bonding your soul to his for all of eternity. He doesn't just come for, for uh, righteous people comes for sinners, he tells us, like me and, and maybe like you. Comes to catch us at our worst, to invite us into his best. But the gift, if you choose to receive it, is to be made righteous in him. Not by our works, but by his works. And we receive it as a simple act of faith. To say, I trust that this gift is now mine. Because you desire to give it to me. It's like coming before an altar in a church and saying, I do, but only you're saying it to the God of the universe. I do. Not I did or didn't do. Not I can. Not I will. Not I know. But I do. I do receive the gift of the second Adam. I do see myself in the double embrace by faith. Now, the moment you say that, let me tell you what happens. The Father and the Son send forth from their embrace a third person in the Trinity who is also God, the Holy Spirit. And what does the Holy Spirit do? Immediately, he creates the bond between your soul and the soul of Jesus. And then immediately, he releases the intimacy of the double bond, that embrace, into your life. And this is where the healing and transformation begin. Friend, I encourage you, I urge you, out of affection, to turn to Jesus today and say to him, I do. If you'd be willing to consider that, I would invite you to come to our website. 
to upc.org slash Jesus. Read a little bit there about what it means to receive this gift and then click through because right now we have people who are available to you. would love to talk with you a little bit, hear your story, share the story of Jesus with you and give you confidence that you belong to him today. And for the rest of us, let's take this time to pray. Would you bow with me? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, what a beautiful story. And it's the only story that is as true as true can be. That you have opened up this circle of love, that you have come to draw us into it without condemnation, but with delight and celebration and joy, releasing transformation into our lives and make us, making us agents of change for those around us. We want to receive this gift today, we pray. Would you renew and refresh us in the arms of our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen.